In this class, we shall deal with the management of uveitis. Itis means inflammation. The treatment of inflammation is to stop the inflammation by the use of anti-inflammatory drugs. The most potent of such agents is corticosteroids. And corticosteroids are in fact the mainstay of therapy in uveitis. What then complicates the issue of treatment with corticosteroids? The question is, what if the cause of uveitis is infectious? Because uveitis can be caused both by infectious and non-infectious causes. In case the cause is infectious, specific anti-infective agent is indicated. Giving corticosteroids in this situation can worsen the infection. But if the uveitis is immune related or non-infectious then corticosteroids will be effective. The problem then is the associated side effects which can be local or systemic and long term use of corticosteroids can cause significant side effects. So the management of uveitis is basically twofold. First to find the etiology and second to treat the inflammation. Finding the etiology is done first by narrowing down the list of differentials by a thorough history and an examination. Examination of the eye as well as examination of systems. At the end of examination, one may end up with something like a young adult male with chronic, recurrent, non-granulomatous anterior uveitis with back pain. Now this will narrow the differential diagnosis to very specific conditions. To find out which of these conditions is the cause, appropriate ocular and systemic investigations are done. A few referrals for the systemic manifestations may also need to be given. After the etiology is found, the next part is treating the inflammation. The specific therapy is for the etiology and the non-specific therapy is generally given in all types of uveitis for managing the inflammation and its consequences. These are a few examples of the ocular investigations that are done in uveitis. Fundus fluorescein angiogram. Cystoid macular edema is a common complication of all types of uveitis. This is very well and easily picked up by fundus fluorescein angiogram. Another example is serpiginous choroidopathy. An uncommon cause of posterior uveitis, FFA in this case helps to delineate the pattern of the lesion also to tell us which part of the lesion is still active. Another investigation used in uveitis is ultrasound. This is especially useful in cases of media opacities. These media opacities could be corneal opacity or more commonly cataractus lens or severe vitreous exudation. These prevent the view of the fundus. To know the status of the retina and choroid in these conditions, ultrasound is very useful. It can detect conditions such as vitreous membranes, tractional retinal detachment, vitreous hemorrhage, etc. Ocular tissue analysis. This is an invasive procedure and hence is not done routinely. If the routine investigations have not yielded any results or more commonly, if there is a strong suspicion of infection or malignancy, then ocular tissue analysis is done. This includes aqueous tap or a vitreous tap or a chorioretinal biopsy. The specimens are sent for appropriate investigations. Some of the examples of the systemic investigations done when there is suspicion of a specific condition. For example, if sarcoidosis is suspected, then serum angiotensin converting enzyme levels or serum calcium levels and chest x-ray are useful. If tuberculosis is suspected, again chest x-ray and a MANTU test are ordered. Toxoplasmosis requires anti-toxoplasma antibody titers. Syphilis is tested by the serological test of either VDRL or RPR and FTA-ABS or TPHA. In clinical practice, Many a time, one does not end up with a specific suspicion of a disease. In which case, core lab tests that are commonly ordered in any case of uveitis include a complete blood count and ESR, chest x-ray, this is basically for sarcoidosis tuberculosis, 
serum is sarcoidosis, VDRL, FTA, ABS uh, for syphilis. Other tests are done depending on clinical suspicion. Treatment depends upon the etiology and can be divided as medical and surgical and in medical you may have specific and non-specific therapy. Specific therapy depends upon the etiology. For example, anti-tuberculosis therapy is given in tuberculosis. Parenteral penicillin is given in ocular syphilis. In fact, ocular syphilis should be considered as part of neurosyphilis and treated as such. Sulfa and pyrimethamine are the drug combination given for toxoplasmosis. Tetracyclines are required in Lyme disease and intravenous acyclovir is the therapy for acute retinal necrosis. CMV retinitis requires IV gancyclovir. Non-specific therapy which may be required in all cases of uveitis include cycloplegic midriatics and corticosteroids. In a few cases, even immunosuppressives may need to be given. Cycloplegic midriatics. Cycloplegia relieves ciliary spasm and hence relieves pain. Midriatics dilate the pupil. This prevents the formation of posterior synechae. They can also break the ones that are already formed. Posterior synechae need to be avoided because 360 degrees of posterior synechae will cause pupil block and secondary angle closure glaucoma. Which cycloplegic midriatic agent to use? If the inflammation is mild, shorter acting, milder cycloplegic midriatics may be sufficient. For example, tropicamide eye drops or cyclopentolate eye drops. This will keep the pupil mobile because the effect will not last for long and so regular use of these drops will prevent the formation of posterior synechae. However, if posterior synechae have already formed or the inflammation is extensive, then longer acting and stronger uh, midriatic cycloplegic agents need to be used. Among these are homatropine and atropine. Atropine, in fact, is the strongest cycloplegic midriatic agent and the effect of this can last even up to 14 days. Corticosteroids, the mainstay of therapy. Corticosteroids are used as topical applications periocularly or systemically depending on the site of the inflammation and its severity. For example, topical drops will be effective for anterior uveitis but will not be effective for intermediate posterior or pan uveitis which will need periocular or subtenons injections or systemic steroids. What are the dictum for the use of corticosteroids in uveitis is use enough, soon enough. That means use a large or a high dose to start off with and also use them early enough in the disease. As in any case of using steroids, they should be tapered before stopping, whether it is topical or systemic. But before the use of corticosteroids, especially systemic corticosteroids, one should investigate the patient for possible flare-up of any systemic infection, for example, tuberculosis. So, investigate the patient before starting. These are the basic guidelines for the use of steroids in uveitis. What are the common corticosteroids that are used? Topically, prednisolone eye drops, dexamethasone eye drops or fluoromethalone eye drops are used. Among these, prednisolone and dexamethasone are potent steroids. Fluoromethalone is a milder steroid but also has lesser side effects. Periocular injections are given with methylprednisolone, triamcinolone or betamethasone. Among these, triamcinolone is the most common corticosteroid used because of its longer duration of action of around 2 to 3 weeks. Systemically, prednisone orally or methylprednisolone intravenous are the common drugs used. As mentioned previously, use of corticosteroids is fraught with complications. These complications have to be looked for throughout the use of steroids. Topical applications of steroids can give rise to cataract and glaucoma. These are the most important side effects of topical application of steroids for any reason. When steroids are given as periocular injections or systemically, even then cataract and glaucoma 
continue to be the main ocular side effects. Cataract and glaucoma can also be the complications of uveitis per se. So this differentiation has to be done during the use of corticosteroids. The complications that are seen in addition to cataract and glaucoma while using subtenons injection of steroids are ptosis and a possible scleral perforation. The side effects of systemically administered steroids are well known. For example, weight gain, peptic ulcer, osteoporosis, diabetes or hypertension.